throughout the history of Canada, certain events are always highlighted and are well enshrined in our collective memory, be it the War of 1812, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the creation of Canada in 1867, or the 1972 Summit Series. However, there is so much more to our history and the history of the land before Canada existed. This podcast endeavors to tell those stories, looking at chapters of our history that may be regionally well-known, but not necessarily well-known nationwide. And while much of the history of Canada is solidly rooted in fact, there are a number of stories which leave more questions than answers. There are mysteries, legends, myths, and stories that shiver the soul. These stories are just as important as the ones we all know about, and we will be telling one of those stories today. Welcome to Canadian History After Dark. They were a family that was seen as the cause of all problems in their small township. It is true the family had a reputation for trouble. After all, the patriarch spent time in prison for murder after a dispute. The children all earned a reputation for violence. It would all come to a head in February of 1880, though, when their farm was burned to the ground and five members of the family were killed by an angry mob. To this day, no one has ever been held accountable for the massacre, which included those who weren't known for participating in the less than honorable actions the rest of the family developed a reputation for. Was this a community taking justice into their own hands? Was it a case of mob rule terrorizing the area in order to drive away those who they considered undesirable? Why was no one ever found guilty of the murders of the family? This is the story of the Black Donnellys of Lucan, Ontario. So, who were the Donnellys? The patriarch of the family, James, immigrated to Canada in 1842 from Tipperary, Ireland, along with his wife, Joanna. They settled in Bidulph, Ontario, and built a homestead. The family wanted to build a home for their family, which would grow to eight children. The land that the Donnellys selected to build their homestead on, however, wasn't technically theirs. The Canada Company owned it. This company didn't do anything about the Donnellys living there, but they did sell the land. In October of 1855, a deed was registered selling the land for 56 pounds to John Grace. Grace would then turn around and sell the southern half of the parcel, which comprised of 100 acres, to Michael Mayer for 200 pounds the following March. The two men then set out to evict the Donnellys and did so by filing paperwork with the courts. Grace's notice was filed with the Court of Common Pleas on May 26th of 1856 and Mayer's on August 20th of that year. This, however, didn't change the living situation for the Donnellys, and they remained on the land. It's worth pointing out at this point, the Donnellys would eventually purchase the northern half of the parcel from Grace for around 50 pounds in consideration of the work to improve the homestead over the past 10 years. Now, over the time that the Donnellys were settled in the Bidolphin Lucan area, a number of community squabbles arose between the other families in the area and the Donnellys. Many of these traced back to Ireland and involved the tensions between Protestants and Catholics. This included Catholics who were friends with Protestants and vice versa. This would play a factor through the whole story. The first death in the tragic tale of the Donnellys actually happened in 1857, and one of the Donnellys was held responsible. In June 25th of that year, a work bee was being held on the property of William Maloney. During this bee, a fight started between James Donnelly and Patrick Farrell. The fight would end with Farrell lying dead and Donnelly standing over him. It is claimed the feud between the two men went back a year or two, and there were some who stated Donnelly had shot at Farrell at one point in time. The tension between the two men attributed to troubles between Catholics and Protestants. That went back to Ireland. Both men were Catholics, but Donnelly had a number of Protestant friends, an idea which many of the Catholics resented. Newspaper reports from the day stated Farrell had started the altercation and Donnelly knocked him to the ground and walked away. Then Farrell, who some witnesses claimed was drunk at the time, picked up a logging hand spike and attacked Donnelly from behind. Donnelly grabbed a hand spike of his own and struck his attacker in the head with it. With the blood of a man on his hands and a number of witnesses, 
Donnelly fled. He would remain in hiding for a number of months and finally turn himself into the authorities in May of 1858. His trial would be held shortly after that. The official record from the trial, held in Goderich on May 14, 1858, read, quote, Jury returned back with verdict of guilty, sentenced to be taken to the jail from whence he came. Then on Monday, the 14th of September, next to the place of execution, there to be hanged by the neck until dead. Unquote. Many people appealed for the commutation of the sentence. This included his wife, Joanna, as well as a number of the Reeves of the municipalities in the area. The Governor General of Canada received these pleas, and they worked. The sentence was commuted to seven years in prison to be served at the provincial penitentiary in Kingston. There was little news about the Donnellys during the time that James was in prison. By the time he was released in 1865, that started to change. His seven sons were becoming adults and starting to make their way in the world. The troubles began in earnest in 1869, when son William was charged with larceny. He was acquitted of those charges. Then the same year, James Jr. and William were charged with robbing the post office in Granton. The two men were acquitted again. The boys started to establish themselves in their careers. There were seven of them, after all. And they also established themselves in the community. James Jr. would move to Michigan for a short bit for a fresh start, but did return home. Patrick learned how to make wagons and carriages and got married. John managed the saloon in Lucan. Robert, Michael, and Thomas worked and lived on a farm at another property in Bedolph, and William worked on the family farm. Now, one of the ways for goods and people to move from community to community was stage lines. These served communities that weren't on rail lines when the rail lines got built, and they would also go from a rail site, a rail station, to communities further out. The Donnellys got into the stage business in 1871 with the sons working for a company called McPhee and Keefe. This work continued for two years before William opened his own line when McPhee went out of business. There were other stage lines, including the Flanagan line, that were in operation, and the competition was cutthroat. There were reports of sabotage, theft, conflict, flights, and more. The romantic lives of the Donnellys was also a cause for conflict in the community. William had proposed to his love, Margaret Thompson. Her father, though, did not want her to marry a Donnelly and sent her away. Margaret wrote a letter to William asking him to come to her to take her away, and he gathered a group of friends and went to the Thompson house to find her. They couldn't, and ended up catching a trespass charge in the process. The group, though, were all acquitted. In 1875, William would marry another, Nora Kennedy. This marriage, however, was not accepted by many members of the Kennedy family, something which would have an impact in the coming years. In 1874, Michael, James Jr., and Robert were evicted from the land they were farming on. The land was then given to Joseph Carswell. Curiously enough, though, shortly after taking possession, a series of unfortunate events befell Carswell. Fires on his property, death of his animals, and so on. Then in 1875, the conflict between the stage lines started to get more and more violent. A stage driver for Flanagan was killed when the wheel fell off of his coach. The Donnellys were blamed, with many saying it was sabotage, but nothing was ever proven. Then a Flanagan coach cut off a Donnelly one, and that caused passengers to be thrown from the carriage. The Donnellys received damages from Flanagan, and in turn, they paid those damages to the two women who were thrown from the carriage. The next five years saw a number of events happen throughout the township, with the Donnellys often being charged for the offenses, but acquitted by the courts nearly every single time. To some, it would appear that the Donnellys were just not well liked by the populace, but the courts, which weren't in Lucan or Bedolph, and therefore not necessarily subject to some of the same biases, were able to see through many of the baseless accusations. The first escalation of the charges happened in 1876. A private investigator came to Lucan and worked with the local constables, determining that the Donnellys had committed a number of offenses. This included some that were alleged to have happened years prior 
but were forgotten until there was a sizable police presence in the community. A riot ensued when the constables went to arrest the Donnellys out of Wanick, and shots were fired. The family escaped, though. Nothing further came from it, with the exception of William. He was charged with assaulting Constable John Bodden. He would be convicted of the assault, but discharged from prison due to illness. The violence in Lucan and Bedal continued to escalate. Stables were burned, stages sabotaged, homes were torched. The village of Lucan appointed Samuel Everett as the village constable to help stem the tide of violence. The Donnellys were often considered to be the perpetrators of the violence, but most of the time there was no evidence. Then in 1877, James Jr. died. He passed away from an illness, but there were some who claimed that he was shot and killed. Even the matriarch of the family was subject to the accusations and hatred. In 1878, Joanna was charged with assault for hurling abusive language at James Carroll, but nothing came of that. Then Constable Everett claimed that someone shot at him. He blamed Robert Donnelly for the crime. Robert was sentenced to two years in jail. Everett, though, was then accused and convicted of assaulting another constable, and at the same time, he confessed that he wasn't sure that it really was Robert Donnelly who had shot at him. In 1879, the chain of events that led directly to the death of the Donnellys was put in motion. A new priest came to the parish, Father John Connolly, arriving at St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church. He had heard the stories of the Donnellys and had a negative opinion of them before even meeting them. However, he wanted to bring peace and stability to the area and created a peace society. He asked the community to support them and to agree to have all of the homes searched for stolen property so it could be returned to rightful owners. The Donnellys, however, refused to participate in this search of the homes. As well, Connolly preached against associating with Protestants this was something that James Sr. couldn't stand to hear and denounced the priest in the church during a service for his hatred. After all, the Donnellys had a number of Protestant friends. The formation of the Peace Society would see a splinter group also be formed called the Vigilance Committee. This committee was made up of many of those who had issues with the Donnellys, real or imagined, including John Carroll. Now, shortly after the formation of this vigilance committee, Carroll was made a constable, and he vowed to rid the township of the Donnellys. He went to Thomas's home and wanted to arrest him on old charges. Chances are they were trumped up, but Carroll wanted to keep his promise. Thomas wasn't home, so he went to Williams. Thomas wasn't there either, but was instead at his parents' place. William warned Thomas of what was happening, and he was able to escape. The Vigilance Committee helped to find Tom, and he was eventually caught, but then acquitted of all charges. After that, the Vigilance Committee would make it known that they would make life a living hell for anyone who associated with the Donnellys. Tragedy would strike the Donnelly family again in 1879. Michael had moved to St. Thomas to work on the railway. He was in Waterford as part of his job when he got into a fight with a man named William Lewis. Lewis stabbed and killed Michael during that altercation. Lewis would be convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to prison in Kingston. On January 15, 1880, the final events started to unfold. That night, a fire burned down the barns of Thomas Ryder. John, Thomas, and William Donnelly were at a funeral. The two other surviving sons not around. So the Vigilance Committee blamed James Sr. and Joanna for burning down the houses. The two were charged and made a couple of local court appearances and were set over to appear for trial on February 4th in the nearby town of Granton. The night of February 3rd, the Donnelly family would prepare for the trial and the trip to Granton. 13-year-old Johnny O'Connor, who lived on a nearby farm, came to the Donnelly's home as he was going to be caring for the animals while they were gone. John left the homestead and went to William's home to borrow a sleigh to travel to Granton, and he spent the night at William's. The rest of the family, along with O'Connor, retired for the night. At the house that evening, James Sr., Johanna, Thomas, young Johnny O'Connor, 
and Bridget Donnelly, a niece who was visiting from Ireland. While the Donnellys were going to bed, the Vigilance Committee set about to take justice into their own hands that night, not waiting for the courts to decide the fate of the Donnellys. Shortly after one in the morning, there was a knock at the Donnelly's door. Thomas answered. Standing before him was John Carroll. There were a number of newspaper accounts of the events from that night, from papers across the continent. We will start with the account from The Globe, written on February 5th. Quote, Very little can be ascertained as to the actual facts attending the butchery of the family. The house, which is a log one, was surrounded about 1.30 this morning by a gang of masked men armed with guns, pistols, axes, shovels, and other weapons. The gang numbered about 25. They burst in the front door, the noise of which awakened the son Thomas, who aroused and went to the door. He was met with blows from shovels and axes, and this morning a large pool of blood was observed just outside the front step, where evidently the wounded man had staggered. The murderers then proceeded to dispatch the other members of the family by, by what means is not known and never will be. As immediately after they had committed their bloody work, they fired the house, which was burned to the ground. The events, as reported in the London Advertiser. Thomas Donnelly, the son, went to the door and was immediately arrested by the crowd. An altercation ensued, Thomas being outside the door when the cry of, hit him on the head with the spade, was raised. And one of the men who carried a spade appears to have struck him on the head with that instrument, and another man used a pick. He fell down, probably dead, and was then thrown inside the door. The other inmates of the house, with the exception of James Connors, the boy, were then clubbed and beaten to death. The boy first hid underneath the bed in a clothes basket, and afterwards escaped. The murderers, after pouring oil on the bedclothes, set fire to the building, which was consumed down to the very foundations. The charred remains, burnt to a cinder, were found in the position where they fell. Thomas's remains just inside the front door, Mr. Donnelly on the floor of the kitchen, and James Donnelly and Bridget Donnelly behind the stove, where they had crouched and were killed. The spade with which the murder of Thomas was committed was found among the debris, it was covered in blood, but the handle had been burnt out and all possible means of identification were thus destroyed. Unquote. It is worth noting that it was an error in the original printing. It was Joanna Donnelly and Bridget Donnelly behind the stove, not James Donnelly and Bridget Donnelly. Now, the newspapers of the day used the hyperbole that was common of the day. It was called the Lucan Horror and a horrible affair at Lucan. The Globe called the massacre the blackest crime ever committed in the Dominion. However, some of the newspapers appeared to celebrate the murders. The St. Mary's Argus wrote, The people of this town were considerably startled yesterday on the appearance of the Argus Extra, announcing the fearful murder of the Donnelly family in the township of Bidolph on Tuesday night. We cannot say the people were horrified, as they no doubt would have been any but the notorious family who have made their name a terror in our adjoining township. While every person regrets that so foul a deed was perpetrated, no one regrets that the community is rid of most of a family who have made themselves a terror to the part of the country in which they resided. The Donnellys were desperados of the worst type, and their neighbors were afraid to witness against them, and no magistrate had backbone enough to convict them. As a consequence, they committed all sorts of crimes with impunity, but now four more of them have said the penalty of their crimes by their lives. The contemplation of such a wholesale murder in a respectable community is frightful, but the most timid among us need not be in the least alarmed. And while we regret exceedingly that such an atrocious murder was committed in our neighborhood, yet the people of the township of Bidolph will breathe the freer." Unquote. The deaths of the family in the Donnelly homestead weren't enough for the bloodthirsty mob, though. After setting fire to the home, they headed to William's house at nearby Wayland's Corners. The mob surrounded the house and called out fire. John Donnelly, who was staying the night there, came out of the home to see what was happening and was shot dead. The others, smartly, remained inside, hiding from the mob. The mob would eventually return to their homes. The next morning, the people of the township came to see the remains of the horror from the night before. They scavenged for souvenirs before police arrived. When the officers did, they would place the remains of the bodies 
or was what was left of the remains into one casket. The afternoon of February 4th, the coroner convened a journey to hear testimony into the inquest and to the deaths. Meanwhile, 13 men were arrested for the crime, including James Carroll. They would make their first appearance in the courts on February 21st. Six of the accused would be held over for trial at the Spring Assizes, while two others were released on bail. Among those who would stand trial was Carroll. On March 2nd, the coroner's inquest would meet for the third and final time. They decided that the Donnellys were murdered by persons unknown. Then on April 13th, the O'Connor home was burned to the ground. Many suspected arson, as young Johnny O'Connor was the only living witness to what had happened. However, he was under guard in London against such reprisals. Given the mood of the situation, as well as the division in the community, the prosecutors petitioned repeatedly for a change in venue. The trial judge dismissed the initial request. An appeal to the Superior Court was also dismissed. Rumors persist to this day that the Attorney General, Oliver Mowat, didn't want to appear anti-Irish Catholic, which would alienate voters in the area. The case would now be held over until the fall assizes. The trial would start on October 4th, with Justice Armour presiding. At the trial, young Johnny O'Connor took to the stand. Part of his testimony read, quote, Tom told him to read the warrant. Carol said there was lots of time for that. Then in a few minutes, a whole crowd jumped in and commenced hammering them with sticks and spade. Then Tom ran out into the front room and outside. I saw him run out and Bridget ran upstairs and I ran after her and she shut the door and I ran back again in the room and got under the bed behind the clothes basket. Then they started hammering Tom outside. The bed was about two feet and an inch high from the floor and no curtains against the bottom of the bed. They carried Tom in the house again. I heard them throw him down on the floor and heard the handcuffs rattling or whatever they had on his hand. Then someone said, hit that fellow with a spade and break his skull open. Then the fellow hit his three or four whacks with the spade. When Tom was outside, I heard him say, oh, oh, oh. I did not see them hit Tom with the spade, but I heard them. Then some of them told the fellow that had the light to bring it here to where Tom was. He brought the light and they were doing something to Tom. They were standing around him. I saw them standing around him. Then I saw Thomas Ryder and John Pertell standing near the room door, the bedroom door. Then some of them asked, where was the girl? Another one answered, look upstairs. Then they went upstairs and saw some of them too, but did not know any of them. Then they came down. I heard nothing going on upstairs and poured coal oil on the bed and set it on fire. It was the bed I was under. I heard someone say the oil would burn off the blanket and wouldn't burn at all. And then they all run out when they set fire to it. Then I got out from under my bed and put on my pants and tried to quench the fire with my coat. I hit the fire with my coat. I heard, then heard Tom breathing. Then I went out to the front room and saw Tom dead on the floor. Then I ran out to the kitchen and trampled on the old women. There was a light from the fire in my bed. Also from Tom's bed, the door of Tom's room was open and the door from the front room into the kitchen. The old women lying between the door from the front room into the kitchen and the kitchen door going outside. I then ran out and went over to Whalen's, Pat Whalen, and rapped at Whalen's door. Unquote. William testified about the events that happened at his house. I was disturbed about half past two by John coming out of his room, through my room to the kitchen. He couldn't go to the kitchen without going through my room. I didn't speak to John. He said, I wonder who's hollering fire and rapping the door. He kept right on and opened the door. When John opened the door going into the kitchen from my room, I heard them holler, fire, fire, open the door, Will. I heard them shouting as soon as I was thoroughly awakened. I heard the door opened. I then heard two shots in rapid succession almost together. John fell back against the door from my bedroom to the kitchen. The distance between the kitchen door and my bedroom is about six or seven feet. His head came down to the jam of the door. I was lying next to the door with the glass top. My wife was sleeping on the outside. There was a stove close to the bed. I turned to the side of the blind and looked out. I saw John Kennedy, James Carroll, and James Ryder. They were partly in front of the glass window. 
Kennedy was standing where his name is now marked on the plan about three feet from the door. James Carroll and James Ryder were standing where their names are written on the plan about nine feet from my window. I saw three others outside of the fence, near to the little gate. I calculated they were William Carroll, Patrick Ryder Jr., and Michael Heenan. I couldn't swear positively to them. I don't speak positively as to them. I speak positively as to John Kennedy, James Carroll, and James Ryder. These persons are well known to me. Now, during the course of the trial, the defense called witnesses that happened to provide alibis for every single man accused. When the jury went to deliberate, those deliberations were over in four and a half hours. They came back stating they could not reach a decision. One juror said he would find James Carroll innocent, even if he witnessed the killings himself. Another stated he did not want to convict Carroll on the testimony of O'Connor alone, given to his age. Five others stated they voted acquittal out of fear of reprisals from the vigilance community. Four did vote to convict, and one was undecided. It was a hung jury. Normally, the trial would then be reheard at the spring assizes, but the Attorney General didn't want to wait. He appointed two justices, Matthew Crooks Cameron and Featherstone Osler. The second trial took place on January 24, 1881. In what many see as a drastic miscarriage of justice, Cameron was said to have aided the defense lawyer, William Meredith, guiding him along through the whole trial. Then the charge to the jury before deliberations all but told them they had no choice but to return a not guilty verdict. And that is what they did. James Carroll walked out of the courthouse a free man, and the rest of the prisoners would be granted bail. No other person would ever be tried for the murders of the Donnelly family. In February 1881, the Donnellys befriended the sons of Michael Feely, Michael Jr., and James, even though the role that that family had played in the massacre. James confessed what happened to Patrick Donnelly, but he was afraid of the repercussions from the Vigilance Committee. After making the confession, the Feelys fled for Michigan. In September of 1881, the Crown prosecutors managed to have those two extradited back to Canada where they were charged with aiding and abetting the murder of Thomas Donnelly. They were released on bail pending trial, but that bail paid for by the Vigilance Committee. The Feelys then refused to provide any testimony at all, and any chances of a third trial disappeared. After the massacre, William would head to Ohio, where he worked in the coal mines for around a year. He returned to Canada and moved to Glencoe, where he became a constable. Patrick stayed in Lucan with his wagon-making business. Robert and Jenny moved to Glencoe, where William joined them. Robert ran a hauling business, and Jenny married a constable in town. In 1897, William would pass away of natural causes. Before he passed on, though, he noted how many of the Vigilance Committee had passed before him, often due to terrible circumstances, natural or otherwise. Robert would be admitted to the London Psychiatric Hospital in 1908 and passed away there in 1911. Patrick passed away from natural causes in 1914 in Thorold, Ontario. And the last member of the family, Jenny, passed away in 1916. For much of the 20th century, the events of the Donnelly Massacre were not discussed at all in Lucan or the surrounding area. Books were written that sensationalized the murders, some painting the Donnellys as a violent family of thieves and murderers, while others used a more sympathetic brush. So how did all of this come to be? No justice for a family that was violently murdered in their own home. During the trials, the press from afar, when taking a look at the evidence, rumors, and accusations, and more with an outsider's perspective, noted the Donnellys were not the villains the Vigilance Committee claimed them to be. In fact, some of the media felt the Vigilance Committee were a bunch of envious, dangerous backwoodsmen. Fear of the Vigilance Committee was a factor in the verdicts in both trials. The committee had worked to sway the opinion of the community, and it even threatened those who associated with the Donnellys before the night of February 3rd and 4th. 
The decision to not move the trial to a location where there would be no preconceived notions of any of the parties involved or even the fear of reprisals of the Vigilance Committee would be another reason why there was no justice for the Donnelly family. The entire saga dates back to a land squabble, a, a murder in self-defense. The people of the community were soured on the Donnellys, and any attempts to resolve the feuds were met with derision by the people of Lucan and Bidolf. Anything that happened in the community would be blamed on them at any cost. This is how the elderly James and Johanna were accused of burning down the riders' barns when their sons, the usual target of those accusations, weren't around. The politicking of the day was also a factor. You had people who were more concerned with how the verdict would affect voters than justice. The case of the Donnellys is one of the greater miscarriages of justice. A group of 25 men who made sure they were wearing things that would make themselves harder to identify went to a home with the clear intent to end the lives of everyone involved. It could be argued the area was controlled by mob rule. While there's no direct evidence for it, after seeing what happened to the Donnellys, it could be argued that many of those in the area who were opposed to the committee kept silent for fear of reprisals. Another thing to look at, the Donnellys were blamed for all of the crimes that happened in Lucan and Bidolf. Well, if that were the case, you would have expected the crimes to taper off in the community. In fact, they would continue. And Carol himself would find himself being charged with some of those crimes. Today, Lucan and Bidolf remember the Donnellys as a part of their heritage. This comes after years of not talking about this dark chapter in the community's history. Indeed, for 1880, it definitely was the blackest crime ever committed in the Dominion. Look for us on Patreon. Join our community, where you will get early ad-free access to our podcast. You will also get access to our weekly live discussions on the history of Canada. Like and follow us on social media. This includes Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Every day we bring you our This Date in Canadian History feature, plus a lot more. Check out our YouTube and become a subscriber. We will be bringing more and more video content in the coming weeks. Speaking of video content, we're also working on a Kickstarter for our documentary series that will be telling some of the stories of Canada that are better told visually than just by audio. And of course, follow along the podcast on your favorite platform. We bring you two episodes a week. One is this episode, Canadian History After Dark. The other is our ongoing anthology series that looks at various events from Canadian history that may not be as well known nationwide as they are regionally. Thank you for listening to Canadian History After Dark. Thank you.